Hello, Professor Gruen here, and we are continuing on our journey through 570 pages of Murex jQuery, second edition. We are on chapter four. We're in chapter four now, where we're going to talk about debugging jQuery and JavaScript applications. As I've mentioned before, I don't use JavaScript every day, and um, so so I'm not super fluent in um, in jQuery debugging, but I am super fluent in debugging because the programming languages I use at work, the code that I write does break or something does happen. Especially, and I've always said if I write code and it works perfectly the first time, then I know I'm going to have really big problems down the road. And uh, a lot of the code that I write, I purposely write it in such a way that it will break so I can make sure that I can capture all the errors along the way so to write um, stronger, more solid code. Now you might ask why um, there's a picture of a stock car uh, on the screen right now. Um, back, ooh, um, 10 years ago, I guess, I had to, let's see, yeah, about nine, eight, eight to 10 years ago, eight years ago, eight to 10 years ago, I used to race in uh, Super X down at the Waterford Speed Bowl on Wednesday nights. And this is the number 34, the car that I drove. And this is before it ever entered a race. This was when it was first freshly built. And um, I raced for about four years and actually went through three cars. My daughter raced, my wife raced. And one time a friend of mine said, oh, you must really love racing. You must really be passionate about racing because you spend so much time racing. Well, the truth of the matter is you spend about 20 minutes, if you're lucky, on the track racing. You crash up your car, you get it all broken, and then you spend the next week, 40, every waking hour that you're not at work or not teaching or not doing something, uh, in the barn, in the shop, fixing it. And so while the car looks pretty, to get it ready for next week, there is a lot of fixing stuff that goes wrong. And you've got to remember, you've got... 20, 30 other people on the track wanting to get first place just as much as you do. And they're going to push you, break you, hit you. You're going to do stupid stuff and um, you're going to end up breaking. So I use this as an analogy to talk to as an introduction to talk about debugging code in general is that while writing the code and that what we call the happy path is nice and easy, the um, spending more time debugging and making sure that the code is solid and works well is really the, the priority. And you'll spend a lot of time um, figuring out why things don't work. So already by now, um, we're in our second week, already by now you've had some good taste of your code not working, things not going the way uh, you would expect. A long time ago, um, how did the word debugging come out? You might may have heard this story, but uh, back in the days when computers were made out of mainframe, uh, were mainframes and were tubes, and actually wires connected one part of the computer to the other to program it, the computer had died and crashed, and what happened was they went through all the computer and they and they found a, a fly, a bug in the computer that actually had short circuited the computer. And they said there was a bug in the system. So that's the, the mythology to how the word debugging is that you wanna take your bugs out of the system. We're going to um, go through and look at um, some debugging terms and understanding. We're going to look at some of the developer's tool. I'm not going to spend time on IE's developer tool. I'm not spending time on Aptana's. I did look at um, the Chrome tool, and it actually is uh, pretty sharp, and I made a, a little sample version that um, on, I made a, a sample uh, web page that I'll have broken, and we'll play with that. And um, I'm also going to provide you some links for a bunch of really good videos that are out on YouTube. A quick go to YouTube and search um, 
debugging JavaScript with uh, with Chrome, there's tons of stuff on on the details there. So um, <clears throat> testing versus debugging. The goal of testing is to find all of the errors before the application goes into production. The goal of the of debugging is to fix all the errors before the application is put into production. So um, in the real world, we actually have a couple of different phases of testing and debugging. A developer will be testing his code as he's building it. I'm working on a project right now, and I write a little bit of code. I run it, make sure it worked. And then I write some more code and run it, make sure it worked. So I'm doing um, unit testing step by step along the way. And then um, a lot of times it might get moved to then another group where it would be sit testing. And, um, and that's really kind of it's the technical testing and making sure your process runs from end to end before you turn it over to the users. And then um, UAT, user acceptance testing, is um, when, you, when you're feeling pretty good about the code, but then you're going to roll it out for a testing phase to the users, and they're going to um, really pound on it. They're going to do everything they can in their normal daily behaviors of, of writing, writing the code, and they're going to um, say, well, I expect it to do this. I expect it to do that. And um, they will report, usually like in a bug tracking tool or a spreadsheet or email, they'll report all the things that it doesn't do. It goes back to you, the developer. You have to find out where, where it went wrong and then make the changes to fix it. Um, one of the hardest things to test and debug are things that cannot be recreated. And so in your testing plan and in working with your testing, you really need to keep track that, you know, I pushed this button, I typed this, I did this, I did this, I did this. That way, when it goes back to the developer, you can say, when I do this, this, and this, then um, this happens. This and this is wrong. This is not what I expected behavior. Um, now, what's also interesting is maybe that steps uh, worked for you, but didn't work for the other person. Then you have to find out all the nuances and the differences. Oh, that person's in Chrome. That person's in Firefox. That person's in Safari. That person's using a different version of Java. That person's using... Uh, so there's any numerous reasons why something can can break. And sometimes it's very straightforward and it's easy and the developer can recreate it. Other times you have to compare environments uh, step by step. So um, what you want to do before you get your web pages out on the website and or, or announce them publicly to, to everybody is you want to um, test it and make sure that it works. And you want to find all the er errors that you can and then debug them, figure out where those errors are, and then fix them. Um, typical test phases. So this is actually pretty good. Test the application with valid data to make sure the results are correct. That's known as the happy path. So I put in this, I put, I put in this thing, I put in this information, I do this information, I go A, B, C, D, and hit the button, and that works. So the first thing you do is you say, does the happy path work? When, when people type in the right things, does it work? Then what to do is test the application with the invalid data to make sure the proper error messages are displayed and the application doesn't fail. So say, for instance, you're expecting a user to type in a number, a numeric value, and then in your JavaScript code, you're going to take that numeric value and multiply it by something, and they typed in a word. Well, that's going to throw an error. So the first time you type in the, in the happy path, you'll type in the number 5, type in the number 10, hit the button, it does the multiplication. The second time around, you type in the number 5. In the next field, you type in the word Fred, hit the button, and it blows up. It throws an error. Because what happened was you didn't catch the fact that an invalid 
uh, data type was actually entered into the field. And then after that, after you fool around with data types and invalid errors and what people might put in and correct that, the last thing to do is try everything you can think of to make the application fail, like unusual or unexpected combinations of user actions. What if the user does this or this or does this and this? I had a friend of mine, Jack Jordan, that I worked with at a company oh, over 20 years ago. And I had, um, he was the purchase, head of purchasing. I wrote an application for him and he went through the happy path. Okay, that works good. And he was happy with that. Then he then he tried, then he went through and typed in some invalid data. I caught it all. I caught it all and everything else. And then he said, and he took his hands and he went rawr, 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 like that on the keyboard, and the whole thing jammed up. And I said, "Don't do that." And there are some level of stuff that maybe you're not going to be able to catch. And I whack Jack on the back of the head. And he was just trying to prove a point. But what actually did happen, by the fact of a massive heart attack on the keyboard, the code did not save. The code was basically saying, popped up when I rebooted, pulled up a new screen, and basically said, OK, do over. I can't handle what you did. Do over. But I didn't mess up anything down the road. Three types of errors that can occur. And we're on page 135 by now. Uh, syntax errors, runtime errors, and logic errors. Syntax errors, most common. Uh, those are things where you type something wrong. You did, you forgot a semicolon. You forgot a um, a curly Q bracket. Um, on page 135, syntax error to violate the rules for how JavaScript statements must be written. These errors are caught by the JavaScript engine as the page is loaded into the web browser. And what often happens when a syntax error happens and you hit the submit button or you expect something happening, you'll get nothing. You'll get dull. You'll It just won't work. Because what happened was... The JavaScript interpreter basically um, says, I can't run at all because the code you wrote just broke. So I never got to become real code to work in the first place. Runtime errors occur after a page is loaded and the application is being run. When a runtime error occurs, the JavaScript engine, engine throws an error, then stops the execution of the application. So that would be the situation where all the code is written correctly and actually loads fine, but a person types in a word where we're expecting a numeric or a numeric where we're expecting a word. And when you got to that if statement or when you got to that part where you're trying to print something out and because you didn't, um, you didn't typecast it to the, the correct data type, that it threw an error at that time. Because what happened is uh, JavaScript wouldn't know what's coming in so to throw that error so that's a runtime error syntax errors they're broken before you even get started runtime errors they'll load but when it works that's something will when the program's running i ah, it gave me something different and logic errors logic errors that's really on you and on the business rules that means you expected somebody to type in something and your program should have done a but it instead did b so a logic error has a lot to do with your if statements your case statements and if this and this happened um did it did it work so for instance or even something like did you do your mathematical equation right were you calculating the miles per gallon right did you have your parentheses correct did you understand um order of precedence in your in your math statement where um where uh, the right events were happening and one and one for some reason was not equaling two it was equaling 17 so that's a logic error so syntax errors won't load at all runtime errors will break when you're running it and logic errors will appear to be working and everything but will provide the wrong answer or the wrong expectations uh, the book goes on on page 135 and uses the um, the miles per gallon with a logic error. I'm going to move beyond that. Uh, here's a couple of 
and I'm now looking at page 137. Common syntax errors, big one, misspelling keywords like element by ID instead of element by ID. So JavaScript has a lot of, and all programming languages have a lot of keywords. And notice that the big difference here between this and this is the letter I, ID is all capitals here and lowercase here. That's two different things and the first one is wrong. Omitting required parentheses, quotation marks, or the curly cue braces. Not using the same opening and closing quotation mark. You put a single quote on one side and a double quote on the other side. Very common error. Um, the dreaded semicolon at the end of the statement. You forgot your semicolon. Those of you in Python, you're loving it that you don't have semicolons in Python, but um, you need semicolons at the end of your lines in JavaScript. Misspelling or incorrectly capitalizing an identifier, like defining a variable named sales tax and referring later to it as sales tax. So here, notice here that sales tax here is the word and sales tax here, but those are two, in fact two different variable names. They are case sensitive. Very, very common errors. Uh, HTML references, referring to an attribute value other th or other HTML component incorrectly like referring to an ID has sales tax when the ID is sales underbar tax. What I find happens to me a lot of times with HTML references is that I will take some code in HTML and I'll, I'll say, oh, this piece of code works good. I'm going to copy it down here. So now I've copied it. I've had it here. It had an ID and a reference. Copied it here. It has the same one. I forgot to change it in the second one or reference it up in the JavaScript the second way. Very, very common. Uh, problems with data and comparisons. Not testing to make sure the user entered in the right type of data before processing. You'll have some examples of that and that what happens is that I got an example where you type in the form is expecting you to type in a number, but a person types in a word. Invalid data, you need to throw, a, throw a, a soft message and say, hey, you typed something wrong. Or this is a required field. You have to type something in there. Not using parse int or parse float to convert a user entry into a numeric value before processing. So that's where you're changing your types to make sure that that, because what happens is a value coming in from the form will come as a string. So if you type a number 17 into a form has a string and then you try to multiply it, it's going to fail. And what you need to do is parse it or typecast it with the parse int method or the parse float. The other thing you need to do is in reverse is if you have a mathematical answer in your JavaScript code. So, you know, miles per gallon equals miles divided by gallon or gallons divided by my, miles. And then you try to concatenate the answer into a string text. You then actually have to parse it to string so it will, in fact, uh, print out correctly. And this is a big one. In the if statement, use one. Um, people use one equal sign instead of two when testing for equality. Um, X equals 20 with a single equal sign is an assignment. If X equal equals 20, that is when you do a comparison. So how you're doing comparisons, typically a lot of times we forget to add that second equal sign uh, in if statements. Um, also, rounding can um, can matter a lot. So here's an example, uh, and the book is talking about that on page 137, where when you do the math, and where we have sales amount equals 74.95, sales tax equals sales amount times 0.1. Notice the numeric value, but then what happens is it's going to get rounded up if you uh, set it to a fixed two, which you should do. I actually, at that same company that I worked with Jack Jordan at, I worked with Sandy Plourge, she was my accountant, and um, I worked on an inventory system. And what was happening is it was doing some math wrong. And she was literally at her, one of the first months that we had gone live with the system. 
her accounting didn't balance for three cents. At the end, she says, this is off by three cents. This, I go, it's only three cents. We are a multi-million dollar company. What are you worried about three cents for? And I took three cents out of my pocket and I threw it on her desk. And she said, find it. So what ended up happening was I actually had rounding errors where I had done some math. And what happened was I uh, was not attributing a, um, a full penny to one thing and only, where basically I took um, the number five and divided it by two and in and I didn't and assigned it to two different things and I didn't uh, equate one of them should have been three cents and the other should have been two cents and so by doing that I had a floating mathematical error now um, years and years ago that was actually how um, developers back in the long time ago hacked money from banks by having floating errors and took those half a pennies and became millionaires. Notice here's an example of sales tax and sales tax being two different words. And also treating undeclared variables that are treated as global variables. So you have to be careful. We won't use a lot of global variables in our code, but uh, if you don't if you don't declare a variable has a global when it should be, um, you won't have access to it in another uh, function. I'm not going to go over the uh, future calculator. Um, here it talks about top-down coding. I'm going to give an example of that in a, in a second uh, on my own little example. So we'll talk about top-down coding and testing and terms, test, debug, bug, throw in an exception, throw an error. The book covers more on that, but basically throwing in an exception allows us to say, if a bad thing happens, catch it here, it's okay. Uh, throwing an error um, basically is when something really breaks. To follow up a little more on global and local variables, go back to page 84 and 85 in the book. And by using strict mode in your code, you'll actually uh, protect yourself from when a variable was assigned at a higher level, at a global level, and it will protect it from being um, duplicated with, within the, the inner function. So page 84 and 85 will give you a little more information on strict mode. Uh, here's the Chrome panel. I'm going to go over that in a minute with... Um, and now uh, three ways to open the Chrome browser will be um, the F12 button. My F12 key is already hot to something else. I'll use Control shift i And we can also use Menu button in the upper right-hand corner, More Tools, Developer Tools. Click on the X or the F12 to, get, to close it. So we'll go over that in a minute. Um, Sources panel after the link in the console. How to find the statement that caused the error. We'll actually go over that. Breakpoints. Um, I usually don't use breakpoints and probably should. A breakpoint will actually stop at a place in the code. Our code is so small, it, um, it, um, you won't use it a lot, but the F, F11, F10, Shift F11 allows you to go step by step through the code. It will stop at a certain breakpoint if you want to say, I want to go as far as here and see how well that I'm doing. And there's that information there. Uh, how, to current, how to view the current data. Scope variables local in the right-hand pan. So let's take a look at that. Uh, when we take a look at our, our test in Chrome is the scope variables. Uh, terms, we've covered those. Internet Explorer, I'm just not going to touch it, but it's um, it looks like it's the same way, F12, developer tools for IE. So if you're an IE person, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that will be very much the same way. Um, at more IE. Testing applications in older versions of IE. Don't kill yourself on that. Let's assume people are using current stuff. Five statements that trace the execution of code. Okay, so what's interesting, console.log, that is a way of doing a print statement um, uh, to, 
to the console and I believe Aptana will give you that. Uh, it'll be interesting. I, I need to try that uh, in my test demo is console.log and we'll see how that works with Chrome. Um, I just don't know, so we'll find that out. And I'm sure console.log will work with Aptana and um, they have, a, I'm sure it has a log window to follow through. Elements that change, um, yeah, we can do that. Uh, this is a really good page to go to, validator.w3.org. This will help find issues with your JavaScript, but more importantly, it will help find issues with your HTML code and your tags and um, and how and that you have well-formatted HTML. So the validator.w3.org is a really good good website. Now I'm going to be adding that to a section in the resources page. Uh, and right, and what's interesting here is notice they will actually um, they'll show you right where the error is in the output of that. And Aptana, we're just skipping over that, and I think that's the last page. And that basically you can validate a HTML file from Aptana. It looks like select file commands HTML validate the source. So it looks like there's some built-in tool to Aptana that will allow you to go out there. Maybe in NetBeans there is as well. Um, I don't know. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I have our little our little program here, and um, let's where I am in Chrome, and right over here is buttons and then I can go more tools developer tools and now we're in the developer mode of the page moving this around you kind of see see different pieces it does uh, it kind of lays out the perspective a little a little differently if I um, if I hit that again it shuts it off the other thing I can go control shift I and it goes in there, control shift I, <clears throat> go that. If I hit the F12 key, another tool will work on my machine, but most likely if you don't have F12 pre-programmed to something else, uh, you'll be fine. So now, right now with the debugger off, if I hit broken code one and I just hit it, I'm getting nothing. I'm getting no response. Broken code two, I'm getting no response at all. Um, what I do have in that code is basically um, the identical same errors are 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 there. I'm pulling up my code. Okay. Now we need to go into uh, debugger mode, and let's first um, let's go old school, top down for for coding. So now. What I would do old school wise is I would just put in a couple of comment statements um, and have just one statement that I knew would work. So here I'm on button one and I have this alert statement here. Watch out for missing semicolons. No matter of fact, that 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 code's even gonna break because I did something on purpose. So let's let's just add Let's just add to the top of this alert, hello world, and make sure we have our semicolon. So now I, all my code is blocked out. You could do a, a block a block comment or just a single line, do what I did one line at a time. Let's save this. Refresh the page. Now I hit the button. Now the alert shows. So the good news is I know that between my button and the alert statement, that code's working. So I know that this piece of code here is working, that button, button one. So for instance, if button one here was typed differently, if this was typed button one, that would not work because it would fail because it would not match this button one. So 
I'm looking at, again, case sensitivity for variables and things that we're passing. So here we see that they are, they are working. It will, in fact, then call do button one, come up to here. Here's do button one, and this alert statement's working. So, but what happens if, if I typed it this way, saved it, refresh the page, click, I'm still broken. So I'm not even getting into the function that I would have to backtrack to figure out where that code went. Come here, fix that, put it back, refresh it. Okay, I'm in at least the alert statement. So I made it there. So now what that I like to do is then just uncomment out the next line of code. Then at that point there, uncomment it out, refresh the page, hit button one, my alert's working, and then it appears to have worked, but I don't know what actually else is supposed to happen. Let's add a line of code to the bottom here called alert all done so that I know I actually made it out of the code. So let's 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 do that. So that way I know that I made it here because I'm not changing any elements. I've saved that, refreshed it, broken. Uh, okay, hello world. Click OK. All done. So that tells me that this line of code worked and this line of code worked, and then this line of code worked. So now we come back here, save it. Refresh the page. First line of code worked. Oops, I'm dead now. I didn't get that all done piece. So I never got to here. I made it to here. I'm assuming I made it to here because the last time I did it, but now this isn't working. Let's just double check. Comment that out. Come back refresh broken one hello all done hmm so i'm really narrowing it down that something's wrong with this line of code so now i have to look at this line of code alert this text dd that's a variable that's in there this text dd oh this text oh i had a typo here so now save that Refresh the page. There's my first hello world. There's my second hello world, where I'm actually now showing um, the, the text that I would have expected in there. And there's my third last one that's saying it's all done. So I made it that far safely. Basically, I was reading the doc, I was getting the, um, the element, the title element. Now, I'm going to actually flip the title element to put new title here. So now let's see, I'm, I'm uncommenting out the next line of code, refresh the page. I made it to here, made it to here, and it says all done, which means I've made it to there. And look, that title did in fact flip uh, that, um, that element on the page, on the DOM. Uh, did change as that code was supposed to. Now I've got one more where it says, watch out for missing semicolons and then this alert. So I'm going to uncomment this line of code out. I'm going to refresh the page. The old title's back. Okay, the first one's there. The second one's there as expected. Watch out for missing sem semicolons. All done. Now that's interesting. That actually, um, I would have expected that to fail. That should have failed because there was no semicolon in there. Um, I want to test something now. Is I'm going to take off the semicolons on all the alerts because now I'm getting upset. Are we going to get to be a little sloppier? 
Hello? So look at that. So for some reason, Chrome is being a little more forgiving than other browsers. So uh, maybe the semicolon, it'll be interesting to test that in another browser to see what happens. But you're supposed to have semicolons after the uh, alert, unless I miss something in some change to JavaScript, which is very, very possible. OK, so now that's going over. And I'm going to put this all back now uh, real quick. And this is just, this is kind of old school, one line at a time. Does this line work? Does this line work? Does this line work? Approach to the code. Now, um, let's put this code in button two. Save it. And all we're going to have really for our error is this text DD. Uh, let's even, let's change this main title to main title DD as well. So we'll, we'll add another error there. Okay. Let's save. We've saved it. Let's refresh the page. Let's hit broken code two. Hello world. And then now I'm not getting through the rest of the loop. So now I'm in Chrome. Control shift I. And then I click on console. And notice here that um, uncaught reference, this text DD is not defined. So it's telling me what blew up. And then I click on the link and it takes me right to that line of code and saying, this text DD is not defined. You've got a problem here. So now I can go to that line of code in my editor, fix it, save it, come back, refresh the page, run broken code 2. OK, I'm good. I'm good. Oops, I blew up again. Notice here, another error showing up in red, uncaught type error on that line of code. And so then at that point here, I'll look, i got to kind of look and do some reading. Oh, there's my error there. And so now I come back here, save it, make the change, refresh, hit the page. OK, OK, OK. And now we're all working in that whole semicolon thing. Now what I am curious about <coughs> while we're in, let's go console.log <coughs> hello my good friends so I'm going to save that refresh the page hit 2 let's see I want to go I'm going to go back to console, and I'm just, boom, 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 boom. I'm going to actually, um, ah, I don't want that. I'm going to control C. I'm going to blow out of Chrome for a minute, pull it back up. I just want to make sure I have a fresh page. More tools, developer tools. Um, I actually want to add is the console log. And I, like I said, I'm just playing here. I'm testing this out. Refresh the page, hit broken code two. Um, right here, notice that on the console it says, this is the console log. And then, hello, my good friends. So 
this statement here, console log here and console log here, is allowing um, you to put in messages to that. So if I went here, and if we said console.log, and then the variable this text so now in on the console log and the so the logging the the kind of the for those of us who've done python the python um view view editor the basically to to the terminal to the screen we can write messages to the console log and i'll refresh the page broken code 2 boom boom Notice here now, this is the text that is being captured from the title. And we're actually writing it to the console log right here. So what that allows you to do is if you've got this whole console log, is you can check different variables to see um, to see how, how they viewed and how they worked. And a lot of times what I like to do on that is I like to go like this. is I like to put them in between greater than and less than signs because if it's null, then it will show me that it's null. Save it, refresh it, page. And notice right here, there's a little sign there and a little sign there. And if that was null, they'd be right up next to each other and say, oh, I've got no value there. So that's a nice way to display a null value. So taking advantage of the console log within the Chrome tool in the editor, and I'm sure um, Firefox with their debugging tools, I'm sure IE, definitely Aptana, definitely NetBeans, all have some version of the same thing. But what you're wanting to do is turn off lines of code. You're wanting to find out in the console tool of the IDE you're using, you're wanting to find out where the error is. And as we saw, that it very easily and very quickly found errors um, and pointed us to it that we then have to read it and figure out what did we type wrong? What are we missing? And things like that. So I hope this um, video has helped uh, make a little more sense of the process. Like I said, you'll be spending more time fixing than you will driving. I spent more time fixing my race car than I did driving my race car um, on the track. And you'll spend oftentimes, if you haven't already, spent more time fixing your code than you have just running it. Because once it runs and it works, ah, you're on to the next project. Okay, have a great night.